Hi everyone, welcome to our ADA preview video. So it's that time of year again, it's June, and on the 23rd of June, the American Diabetes Association Scientific Sessions Conference is going to begin over that weekend. And there are a variety of sessions that we're looking forward to. There's a real emphasis on incretin therapy, weight loss, and type two diabetes this year, but there are also a number of other sessions that we've thought are really interesting as well. So we're just gonna talk you through those, and hopefully you'll find some interesting sessions that you'll want to attend. So starting off with a molecule that we're all quite familiar with, semaglutide, there's some new data coming out, isn't there, Patrick? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got, this is on oral semaglutide, and it's looking at these higher doses. So not the doses you're used to, up to 14 milligrams. This is 25 and 50 milligrams. So it's two additional dose steps. And, and it's, uh, we've got data coming out in type 2 diabetes, known as, the study's known as Pioneer Plus. And we've already got the headline data, which has already been announced to shareholders. Um, and that was a 2.2% reduction in HbA1c and a 9.2 kilogram weight loss. So really very similar data to what we'd see really with a, with a 2.4 uh, milligram um, uh, injectable once weekly we go V action. Um, obviously not licensed uh, uh, for type 2 diabetes. But we've also got, talking about obesity, we do have um, the, a similar study really looking at oral, these higher doses of oral semaglutide, uh, 25 and 50 milligrams in um, obesity. And the uh, headline uh, data again has been released and that's a 17.4% uh, uh, weight reduction uh, compared to a 1.8% uh, reduction in the placebo arm. So really what we, I think in summary, we're seeing the power of those once weekly injections in a once daily pill. Um, uh, in terms of tolerability, we've just got a little bit of detail on that again already, which talks about it being relatively well tolerated, but exactly what that means. Uh, obviously, the granularity we're going to get in the study. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, so, so that's what's new, or certainly catching my eye with, uh, with uh, GLP-1s. Yeah, so that's really interesting how the semaglutide story is evolving. I'm pretty sure there are going to be some questions in the audience because there is a bit of a crisis with supply of injectable semaglutide in particular, but there will no doubt be a knock-on effect to oral semaglutide, and this data, being quite exciting, may uh, drive further prescribing of oral semaglutide. Absolutely, and, and because there's no of uh, these higher dose tablets available, I, I suspect there'll be people wanting to go out there and, and take two, three, four of the uh, 40 milligram uh, Rebelsis tablets if they can get hold of them. But, but I don't think that's a very good idea, for, because remember, this is a really clever tablet which has got an a, 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 a absorption enhancer. It actually gets absorbed directly through the stomach rather than through the small intestine. Um, so they these studies, uh, each pill in a sense is a delivery device. If you, if you send four small missiles in rather than one big missile, it's not quite the same. And you, you, can, you may get different adverse effects, you may get um, different clinical effects. It really is going into the unknown. So I, I, I would strongly caution against people doing that. Let's just wait until we've got these tablets. And hopefully, because it's tablets rather than plastic, maybe we, we, the, the, when they do start producing them, supplies will be better. But you're absolutely right, uh, uh, there, are, there are issues with supply. Yeah, so moving on from those missiles to, uh, to something which is, uh, from my clinical experience, something that I've not really used at all, tazepatide, but obviously does have a license uh, for use in type 2 diabetes. Now, tazepatide is a dual incretin agonist, so GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist. And we've now got more data here for the, from this amount two trial. So this is a phase three trial looking at patients with type two diabetes and who are overweight or have obesity. And over the 72 week uh, duration of the study, we saw up to 15.7% weight loss as the primary outcome, which again is very encouraging and builds on the story of incretin therapy and now particularly with the dual therapy. Uh, something that uh, I look forward to being able to use. It'll be interesting to see where that fits in, not only in terms of formulary, uh, but also in terms of the, the current crisis that we're having with supply as well. Uh, but some really encouraging uh, results there for people living with type 2 diabetes and obesity. So some, some excellent weight loss there. But this is a bit of a debate, isn't it, Amma, about you know, dual therapies and the use the availability, how it's going to be implemented, and that's touched upon in, in the session in the conference, isn't it? Yes, that's right. This is, um, uh, this is a session that I probably would find as interesting as some of the data sessions and the major trial announcements. It's, it's, a, it's a dual incretin duel, they call it. So it's basically a, uh, two people arguing um, the pros and cons of, of, of dual incretin therapy, and, and can we afford it, can we not afford it? Um, and I think that's really interesting how you put you know, cost effectiveness, clinical effectiveness, policy level discussions into the setting of these medications, which are you know, 
the now near future, if not already, um, and, and where does that fit in into the landscape of, of A, type 2 diabetes management, but B, obesity management, which is kind of what be interesting. I'm actually really interested to see what that shows, and that's also uh, another highlight for me. So, so there's that, but that's not all as far as incretins are concerned. So really moving the story forward with incretins, we're now looking at triple agonists or triagonists, and you're going to tell us a little bit about a session that's going to give us some new data for that. Yes, yeah, so uh, triagonists, so GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon agonists now. Um, we, we talked about this last year. Patrick, I think you were very keen on this, went to the session, and, and there's already some data on it as well. Um, we prefer the term triple G to triagonists, but um, yeah, we're happy with the terms they use. Uh, and this is retatratide. So again, this is a molecule that is a tri triple agonist. And we've already got some data on this, already suggesting that actually the weight loss you see with this molecule is even greater than tazepatide. So we're looking at around 24%, 20-24% reduction in weight um, with this molecule, which again, it just pushes the, the weight loss kind of um, magnitude even further. And this is something that's being developed. This is a phase two trial results. They're looking at people with type 2 diabetes, obesity, and interestingly, NAFLD, so fatty liver disease. I think this also is looking at the use of these molecules in other conditions like fatty liver. And I think this is a real insight into what is coming in the near future and, and where, you know, where we're going to go beyond obesity, but also with obesity as well and diabetes. So really interesting stuff. And, and that's a really highlight for me as well. So we've got a lot of data now, haven't we, for, for the incretin group, the GLP-1 agonist, the twin cretins, the triagonist. Um, and I know, uh, Patrick, uh, as you often do on the back of an envelope, you've done some scribbling, yep. looking at the extent of weight loss uh, across these uh, molecules, but also depending on whether the person has type 2 diabetes or not as yep. well. Could you just give us a bit of an overview of that? Well, I mean, first of all, an important thing to remember, if people have got type 2 diabetes, it's much more difficult for them to lose weight. So, and, and of course, some of these studies will have patients with type 2 diabetes for various length of time on various different treatments. So the cleanest way to look at it is probably looking at just that obese population who don't have type, uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, and, and, you know, the most effective um, <coughs> GLP-1 we've, we've got, which tends to be semaglutide by the looks of it, either oral or once weekly injection in the high dose, is about a 15% uh, uh, weight loss ballpark figure. And then the twin cretins, it's about 20%. And by the looks of it, with the triple G, we're looking at about ballpark 25% in that group. So it's, we can see these things moving forward. And, and really that term bariatric medicine really comes to life when we start to see these numbers. And that's why these new conditions are popping in like NAFLD, because we do know the greater the weight loss, you get the greater benefit in these conditions. You know, obstructive sleep apnea, maybe there's going to be studies. Anyway, I could go on and on and on, So, uh, but we can't. Uh, so back to you, uh, Amrit. Okay, so we've, we've spoken at length, and I think this excitement that we have really is primarily because of the data that's coming out, but the, the compelling data and the impact this could potentially have on not only people living with type 2 diabetes, but as Amma mentioned, that obesity field as well. But we will move on. Let's, let's go back to some traditional areas of the conference, perhaps. Type 1 diabetes and the complication, in particular, chronic kidney disease. There was a session that stood out for you, Patrick, wasn't there? Yeah, well, I suppose the background to this is there's been these huge advances in, in uh, uh, the management of type 2 uh, uh, chronic kidney disease uh, in type 2 diabetes um, uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors and non-steroidal MRIs. And, and then we've got, but what about type 1 diabetes? We know the adverse effect profile of SGLT2 inhibitors in terms of decay is much greater risk in, in type 1 diabetes, and we haven't got any licensed uh, treatments for type 1 diabetes. But, but of course, you know, the length of time you have diabetes, potentially the greater the risk of, of developing chronic kidney disease. So, and so that type 1 diabetes, therefore, is a really important subgroup um, that, you know, for those people who are living with different forms of diabetes that we really need to be concerned about. Um, and, and I think they, well, how, there was a session, it talks about really, is it the same condition? So I think that's a really interesting thing. I want to be there to think about it. I mean, and I'm also aware one of those non-steroidal uh, MRAs, fenanarone, is actually undergoing a phase three trial now in type one diabetes. So that, they're recruiting right now. It's often difficult to recruit into these studies. So, so um, hopefully this will uh, infuse and empower uh, people to, to think of this important study. And, and for those people who maybe are watching this who have got type one diabetes, you know, there is some treatments maybe coming your way in the, uh, about this. So it's, it's another thing on the horizon which, which uh, you know, we, we want to see that develop and hopefully improve the lives of people living with type 1 diabetes. Excellent. Thanks for that, Patrick. That will be a really interesting session to attend, I think. Um, taking a step back from medication therapies, just for a moment, um, a nod to surgical intervention, and particularly in type 2 diabetes outcomes. There's uh, some data being presented there as well, isn't there? Yes, there is. And I know we're coming back to the weight loss uh, theme again, but uh, again, this is, this is the key area really in the world at the moment. And um, 
there's there's always been a, a kind of a debate about strength of evidence with 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 um, metabolic surgery and and durability of metabolic surgery over time, and then comparing that to medical therapy. So this is kind of where this this, this trial, the arms type the T2D trial, is 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 going to present its data, and it's looking at a long term follow up of, of four an amalgamation and alliance is part of the, is what they use of. Um, Four randomized controlled trials looking at obese uh, bariatric surgery versus medical therapy. <clears throat> Sorry, and uh, and so they're going to present that data, looking at seven to fifteen year follow up of that, seeing which is more durable in terms of efficacy, uh, metabolic surgery versus medical therapy. There's always some remission data suggesting that metabolic surgery is is better in terms of diabetes room type to diabetes remission. Um, so we can probably expect what we might see, and the earlier data from all these randomized controlled trials suggest surgery is better than medical therapy. I guess my, it'd be interesting to see, but again, my only issue with that is it's, you know, we need to probably repeat this in about five or six years' time or even a bit longer once we have these other molecules we've just talked about to really, you know, compare it. And I think I'm looking forward to you know, type, so the arms type 2D2 or something when they do that, because I think that'll be really interesting. Um, but again, something to look at, something, something different to see. Okay, brilliant. Getting towards a bit of a wrap up here, we thought we'd just mention one more session, which is actually on the first morning of the entire conference and a debate um, on uh, initial combination therapy in type 2 diabetes. So the, the session is titled, Are Two Better Than One? And, and we could argue, actually, we're, we're almost already there, aren't we? We've got guidelines, NICE, for example, uh, recommends early sequential uh, initiation of metformin and, and, a, and a second line therapy uh, for certain cohorts of patients. And, you know, so is that really a debate, Patrick? Uh, because I know you were actually deconstructing this debate and asking other questions, weren't you? Well, I think a better debate, so if you're watching ADA, uh, would have been, and maybe this is for next year, is about remission versus dual uh, initiation. Because, of course, you can't do both um, if you're going to be using uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And, and, and remember, certainly those of us who work in clinical practice, uh, you know, the hope of, of actually being off medication and not having diabetes is, is, is so motivating for patients. And then when we're talking about remission, just you know what you've said there, Amal, what about surgery versus, um, you know, uh, 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 not food uh, versions, you know, it's a low calorie, very low calorie uh, diet, smooth, you know, supplement type remission that we've seen in direct study, for example, um, you know, as I said, versus actually a medical therapy, which, as you say, NICE is already there. Um, you know, most of my patients are eligible for dual therapy when they start. A lot of patients with very high HbA1c's, NICE already tells us we should be using two therapies. So, so it's, it's, it's um, yeah, I, I think this is a debate really which is, it, it's, I don't, I'm not quite sure why it's there actually. Anyway, that's, that's my view on it. I guess it picks up kind of what you said. Um, it'd be interesting from a health economic point of view and a policy level discussion of, you know, what do you prioritise or how do you prioritise all three, or, you know, three different methods? Is it diet and remission or is it... Um, combination therapy or what and, and does this also feed into the whole Verify trial with the kind of DPP-4 and metformin or is it looking at triple therapy then with people with cardiovascular risk and then you have an SGL2 on there as well. It, it's a bit unclear and I, I wonder what they mean exactly by that but um, um, it's just inertia or maybe it's just a bit more but yeah a lot, a lot of things around it which are more interesting than just that topic. And I think for those people who think you're my goodness, my patients can't be taking all these tablets or having all this, this going on. Remember, there are some groups where we need to be much more uh, careful about how we manage those younger people being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Really, uh, we need to be pulling out all the strings and using all the evidence we have to, to drive at that. And that goes back to what you're talking about, policy and, and a sustainable NHS, etc. Brilliant. So as you can see, this, this conference really does cover a wide breadth of different uh, topic areas. You know, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, complications within those, obviously the obesity field, and the variety of treatment options for which we're now having more and more data being presented. So I think it's going to be a really interesting conference. It always is with the American Diabetes Association. We're going to be there. We're really looking forward to these sessions and others, and we'll be updating you uh, during the course of the conference as well. So keep posted to our social media platforms, in particular our Twitter page, which will be on fire during the uh, conference. Uh, but uh, for today, that's all from us. I'm Patrick. Thanks a lot for your thoughts. We'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.